Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, ESG Investing and How It's Evaluated by Allocators. My name is Drew McMahon. I'm the Business Development Director at CSE Fund Services, and I'll be your moderator today. Joining us today as our keynote speaker is Esther Pan Sloan from the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Following her speech, we will have a panel discussion on what asset allocators look for when evaluating ESG. Michael Patnella from Grant Thornton will lead the discussion with Lori Heinel, Global Chief Investment Officer at State Street Global Advisors, and Joe Holman, CEO of ESG Administration, LLC. Our keynote speaker, Esther Pan Sloan, joined the United Nations Capital Development Fund as the Head of Partnerships, Policy, and Communications in October 2016. Prior to joining UNCDF, Esther was a U.S. diplomat for 10 years. As advisor at the permanent mission of the United States to the United Nations in New York, she was on the U.S. team that negotiated the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. She also served on the executive boards of UNDP, UNICEF, UNOPS, and UNFPA, pushing the agencies to become more effective, efficient, and accountable for results. And with that, let's welcome Esther. Thank you, Drew, and thank you very much to CSC. I'm honored to be here today to speak about the SDGs, ESG, and impact investing. Today, I'll review the history of the SDGs, talk a bit about the current landscape of ESG and impact investing, and discuss the opportunities we see at the United Nations Capital Development Fund, a UN aid agency using finance to fight poverty in the world's least developed countries. Let's start with the history. The Sustainable Development Goals were adopted by all 193 member states of the United Nations in September 2015. This development agenda was a successor to the Millennium Development Goals, which ran from 2000 to 2015, were addressed to poor countries and focused on poverty, health, and education. The SDGs were very different from the MDGs in some key ways. They are the first UN development agenda to be negotiated by all member states in open sessions that were broadcast live around the world. The MDGs and most UN negotiations are decided in closed door sessions by group of experts. The SDGs are also universal, meaning they apply to Norway as well as Nigeria, and that every country in the world has committed to achieving them. They recognize multiple stakeholders, including the private sector, for the first time. Previously, only governments or multilateral entities were considered development actors, but the SDGs recognize that NGOs, academia, business, and other groups would have to be partners in achieving development progress for all. And the SDGs are the most comprehensive development agenda the UN has ever seen, reflecting the key priorities of most regions and countries in the world. There are 17 goals and 169 indicators with measurable time-bound ways to track if the SDGs are being achieved or not. They are meant to be the global roadmap for people, planet, and prosperity. For people, planet, and prosperity. The SDGs are very inspiring, and I was lucky to be part of the process that created them. However, the SDGs are not entirely investable. Well, some are and most aren't. So here's an example. Goal one, end poverty in all its forms everywhere. Goal one, end poverty in all its forms everywhere. This is a very laudable goal and one shared by the entire world. Here is goal 1.A, which gives more detail about what this means. Ensure significant mobilization of resources from a variety of sources, including through enhanced development cooperation, in order to provide adequate and predictable means for developing countries, in particular least developed countries, to implement programs and policies to end poverty in all its dimensions. There's a lot of diplomatic code words in there, so let me translate that for you. Provide enough money from wherever you can, including more aid funding, to give developing countries, especially the poorest, enough to take action on this goal and help their citizens. Because one problem with lofty UN development agendas is that once everyone agrees to the words on paper, poor countries are often left with no way to do what everyone has just agreed to. And the indicators for this goal on 1.A.1 are the proportion of resources allocated by the government directly to poverty reduction programs, and the proportion of total government spending on essential services, education, health, and social protection. So that is how governments will indicate if they are making progress on this goal on poverty, and those particular aspects are not investable by this group. However, goal two, 
is hunger. And more specifically, it is end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. So goal 2.A says increase investment, including through enhanced international cooperation, in rural infrastructure, agricultural research and extension services, technology development, and plant and livestock gene banks in order to enhance agricultural productive capacity in developing countries, in particular least developed countries. And the indicators for this target are the Agriculture Orientation Index for government expenditures and total official flows, including official development assistance plus other official flows to the agriculture sector. Now this goal is investable. There is an increasing demand for commodities and secure food supplies. Technologies like ag tech, digital payments, apps that give farmers instant access to weather reports or crop insurance, these are all areas that could produce both impact and profit in the future. And foreign direct investment or investment by private sector entities into a, a developing country is an official flow of finance. So investments made by you or your clients into this type of investment opportunity would count towards the official measure of if this SDG is being achieved or not. The lesson here is that we could go through every one of the sustainable development goals, and you would find that many of them require public financing by government, advocacy by NGOs, or similar actions that have nothing to do with investors or fund managers. But you would also find many, many opportunities to invest, especially if you or your clients seek impact as well as financial return. Now let's turn to the landscape. We know that this topic is increasingly relevant to impact investors because the assets in this category keep growing from $502 billion in 2019 to $715 billion in 2020, a 42% increase according to the Global Impact Investment Network and industry group. Morningstar reported in February 2021 that ESG funds captured $51.1 billion of net new money from investors in 2020, the fifth consecutive annual record and more than double the $21 billion that went into ESG funds in 2019. Between 2018 and 2020, total U.S. domiciled sustainably invested assets under management, both institutional and retail, grew 42%. $17.1 trillion, up from $12 trillion, according to the Forum for Sustainable and Responsible Investment. This means that 33% of the roughly $51 trillion of assets under management in the United States now has an environmental, social, or governance screen. And women, millennials, and the coming transfer of wealth from baby boomers to their heirs means that this trend will likely only continue. So what is the opportunity here? With the flow of assets into ESG investing, there are now hundreds of funds with a sustainability, climate, or ESG focus. I will give you a sense of what UNCDF looks at with our own investment operations. It's very different from the deals you see, but I hope it will be useful in giving a sense of our investment and development thesis. First, our investment thesis is focused on market development in the last mile, reaching underserved populations, and the missing middle finance gap. So in market development, we mean that we want to ensure a viable market is created for products that expand economic access and opportunity to underserved populations. One example of this is a ride-sharing company in Kampala, Uganda, called Safe Boda. It's ride-sharing for scooters, and it worked like Uber for scooters. However, last year when the pandemic hit, Kampala was put under quarantine, and Safe Boda and its 18,000 drivers and Safe Boda and its 18,000 drivers were about to go out of business. So the government asked us to support them. UNCDF helped Safe Boda pivot its digital app to add food delivery to the ride sharing, and it helped hook up local vendors, so farmers who bring their vegetables to markets. It helped 800 of those local ve vendors uh, hook up to this digital app. So if you were quarantining in your house in Kampala, Uganda, and you wanted to order tomatoes and some corn, you could order on the app, and a safe boater driver would drop it off to your house, and you could pay digitally. So this helped save the jobs of the drivers. It helped hook up 800 smallholder farmers to a platform where they could access customers in a new way, and it allowed the government to keep social distancing and keep people safe from the pandemic. Other examples of this type of work are digital payment apps that allow people to pay for solar panels, utilities, or school fees by topping up the prepaid credits on their cell phones. 
or digital wallets and bank accounts that allow poor people to save very small amounts of money safely on their cell phone. Our focus on underserved and vulnerable populations is to ensure that the poor are included in new technologies so that when a mobile network operator, for example, brings mobile services to a developing country, they don't stay only in the capital areas and serve the wealthy and middle class. They will also, um, we help them to move to rural areas to ensure that cell towers go up in rural areas as well and that poor populations and rural populations are not left out of digitization and other de developments. The missing middle finance gap is the gap in financing that we have found at small ticket sizes for small entrepreneurs in developing countries where entrepreneurs are not able to access the funding they need to start or grow a business that could have an impact on the sustainable development goals. An example of this is Aptech, a solar panel company in Uganda that was started by two Eritrean brothers and it sells solar panels and other components for uh, clean cook stoves and other um, clean energy products like that. So the company was cash flow positive, but every bank in Uganda turned them down when they needed a loan to grow because they didn't have enough collateral and uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't pass the formal credit checks and screenings of the banks. So UNCDF came in and made a $250,000 loan in November 2018 at 15% interest which is a concessional rate to what the market offers, but is still competitive. And the two brothers paid off the loan in full by February 2021. And because of the fact that they paid our loan off and they built a credit history with a UN entity, they were able to secure a $1 million follow-on finance short-term loan from Standic Bank, one of the banks that had turned them down previously. And now they've been referred to a commercial fund for a follow-on debt and equity should they need it after they use this $1 million loan. And for their impact, as of December 2020, Aptech had sold 14,000 products and components, including 218 solar water pumps, and their beneficiaries, um, and they had reached 38,392 beneficiaries who gained access to clean water, clean energy, or both. So UNCDF has now made 26 of these types of loans and guarantees to small businesses in seven least developed countries. And we are looking to scale to all 46 least developed countries in the next four years and build a pipeline of these investable businesses to fill a $250 million privately managed blended finance fund, the BUILD Fund, that we run jointly with Bamboo Capital Partners, an impact investor out of Switzerland. So our goal is to take a company that has development impact and financial viability and get it through this missing middle finance gap to the point where it is commercially investable by uh, commercial finance, um, a provider of commercial finance. We hear from investors all the time that there's no investable pipeline in our country. We think there is, and we think our catalytic use of grants, technical assistance, and concessional loans can help these companies to a place where you or your clients might consider them a viable impact investment. Foundations like Oxion International have shown that fi microfinance, which started out to serve the poor, could be spun out into profitable banking enterprises. Compartamos, a Mexican microfinance NGO that became a bank, raised $467 million in its 2007 IPO and paid its equity investors returns of 53%. So that's an example of a sector that started out to serve the poor but became a business. And we think at the United Nations that there are many more of those sectors out there in emerging markets waiting to be discovered. Finally, I want to leave you with a few names, Fowry, Interswitch, Jumia, and Flutterwave. These are all companies founded in Africa. Jumia is an e-commerce platform, and the rest are fintechs. Fowry is Egyptian, and the rest were begun in Nigeria. And they are all unicorns, currently valued at $1 billion or more. With AgTech, FinTech, Edutech, and more, we are seeing that the possibilities of investing in emerging markets for both impact and financial return have never been greater. We at the United Nations look forward to working with all of you to grow the field of impact investing and help achieve the SDGs for all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Esther. That was extremely informative and I think sets the stage perfectly for our panel to dive deeper into so many of the issues that fund managers are facing in the ESG universe. I'll turn it over to Michael Padanella, National Managing Partner at Grant Thornton. Thank you very much, Drew. And I'm happy to be your moderator today 
along with our presenters, Lori and Joe. ESG is a very important and focus point at Grant Thornton, both for our clients and also as an organization. Spent a lot of time in the last five plus years uh, really focusing on, on ESG. And, you know, I think what you'll hear today from, from us is that this is here to stay. There are different reports out that are talking about the ESG universe getting up to a trillion dollars. So with that, I'm going to ask Joe the first question. Joe, Joe, what type of trends are you seeing in ESG? Well, first of all, I want to begin by defining what ESG is. We have ESG funds and we have ESG policies. And we're seeing a lot of trend now for capital moving towards ESG funds, which an ESG fund is, is a fund created to uh, identify sustainable outcomes, whereas an ESG policy is a set of data points that are non-financial to identify risks and opportunities. And what I'm seeing is that though there's a lot more interest in ESG funds, I'm seeing a lot of fund managers developing and implementing ESG policies at the request of investors. But managers have to understand that just because you have an ESG policy, it doesn't make an ESG fund. So the trend is becoming managers are understanding that and beginning to implement these policies within their portfolio. I think that's a really important trend. Thank you very much, Joe. And, and Lori, can you talk a little bit about some of the trends in the actual investing side of it? Sure, and, and thank you again for having me today. I think the first thing I would say is that literally every client is looking at ESG right now. And so the idea that ESG is something that just sort of sits alongside your desk, I think that we're past that stage. ESG interest is accelerating. Uh, ESG types of investment strategies are getting more and more adoption, and there are certain areas like climate in particular that are becoming uh, quite important as a uh, portfolio um, you know, additive, if you will. So the idea that ESG is here to stay. I think the other thing that's related to that is every investor is also trying to think about what their own intentionality is around ESG. So, you know, I mentioned climate. Most investors are trying to assess the implications of climate. And it's a sort of easy one to get your head around because there are so many tangible material elements related to climate. It's not just the stranded assets issue. It's also the, um, you know, potentially the physical exposure issue, you know, real estate that might be in flood zones, uh, extreme weather events, supply chain disruption, et cetera. But there are other elements, um, you, human capital, governance, other things that uh, investors are really trying to assess to figure out how they want to have their own intentionality with respect to ESG and what that means in terms of all of their stakeholders. And, and frankly, their primary consideration, which is to get the best investment outcomes that they can achieve for, on, on, behalf of, on behalf of their, uh, their underlying uh, investors. And then I think the last piece of it is this whole idea of data. And I think this is the one that's actually going to be the most important in some ways going forward because the way that we're going to be able to know if we've arrived, so to speak, is that we'll have the data to be able to measure the ESG outcomes alongside the investment outcomes. And there are a variety of, again, third-party or external stakeholders that are driving this, you know, whether it's the reporting requirements that we're starting to see come out of Europe, for example. Um, so the whole area of how do you get reliable, uh, you know, comprehensive, uh, consistent, and transparent data upon which to make good decisions. We think that's going to be a big theme over the coming uh, years and even decades. Thank you so much, Lori. And you hit a lot of key points for uh, later in the presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Joe, for that. And I think we're going to stay with you. And Joe, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about ESG and the different funds policies. And, and we know that everyone has a little bit different of a description, and that's some of the complexity uh, of understanding and trying to really level set what ESG means, um, you know, for an asset manager. So, Joe, can you talk a little bit about um, the policies that you're seeing and um, how that kind of, intertwines with the due diligence process for new investments. All right. Well, ESG policies are created to incorporate non-financial ESG data into the investment process 
And then it's how that manager wants to use that information. So if you have an ESG fund, you're using those data points to create sustainable outcomes. And if you're a typical fund, you're going to use that ESG data for risk mitigation that we spoke about. But the only way that that data can be used is within the investment process, and the people that are in the investment process is the investment team. So one of the things that companies have to learn to do is incorporate that ESG policy, that ESG process, within their investment process. And to do so, um, they'll have a much more robust uh, policy. What due diligence firms that send out questionnaires are looking for is to see whether, in fact, that is happening. So a lot of firms will have the marketing group, the investor services group, uh, operate and run the, invest, uh, the ESG policy. But that's not really how the ESG policy is designed to be used. It's designed to be used by the investment teams. And if the investment teams aren't using it, then it's not a, an effective policy. So that's what we're seeing in the due diligence questionnaires, and that is investors drilling down to see how is that policy being incorporated within the investment process, and they want specific examples of how did that policy drive an investment decision. Thank you, Joe. Lori, do you have any comment on that, and maybe a little bit about your investment you know, policy as it relates to ESG? Yeah, I would echo uh, what Joe just said. Um, one of the things that uh, some on this call may not appreciate is that even though um, Safe Street Global Advisors is a very large index fund manager, we also have a variety of active capabilities as well. And one of the things that we set out to do a couple of years ago was to work with each of the individual active teams, and we have more fundamentally based teams, we've got quantitatively based teams, we've got growth oriented, we've got value oriented. And we wanted to make sure, as Joe uh, described, that there was an authentic expression of how those teams were integrating ESG into their investment process. And it was interesting because at the outset of that project, there was some skepticism uh, from some of the teams that they you know, were thinking sort of in terms of the traditional industries that might be, um, you know, brown revenue oriented, whether that be things like utilities or energy companies and things of that nature. And I think what was really interesting is that they went through the process of engaging with our ESG team and, and getting a better understanding of the many ways that ESG impacts could influence materially the results of company future performance, uh, whether it was through uh, stranded assets or you know, infrastructure risks, supply chain, human capital. Uh, so there were a whole host of things that as they started to really dig in and understand the breadth of the implications of ESG, it's the, you could see the light bulbs kind of go off for each of the teams. So they really started to think about, well, what kinds of questions would they want to ask of management? Or what supplemental analyses might they want to do to pressure test the financial statements? And how would those things then be embedded in their overarching investment philosophy and process? So uh, we actually saw it kind of firsthand, just as Joe described. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think you talk about disclosure and financial reporting, which I think is going to catch up to a lot of this focus. Um, there was a Morningstar report that you know, recently came out, and it talked about uh, proxy voting and how it could possibly be a backdoor entry for ESG uh, investing. And I think one of the statistics on it was only about 3% of the 401k plans are currently offering investments labeled as, uh, you know, ESG causes. And mostly um, the retail investors aren't, aren't able to really establish any type of footprint there. But with the various advocates and some of the regulatory pressures, I think that could be, you know, possibly something that's going to change in the proxy voting process. Uh, process and maybe some of the retail investors can gain some leverage over the way companies are um, voting on shareholder proposals. So, Lori, with that, do you have any thoughts on that and how that could influence and, and possibly increase the amount of ESG investing? That, that's a really great point. And again, the benefit of us being one of the larger index-oriented managers is that uh, asset stewardship, proxy voting, company engagement 
is a primary lever through which we influence behavior because we don't have the luxury in our index book of business of just walking away and divesting of a company. So we've had a, an active stewardship and engagement platform for decades now, and I think um, some might be familiar with some of the causes we've taken up over the years, including uh, the diversity cause where we um, called upon boards to diversify their boards, uh, uh, their board memberships, because we had seen that you know, there were lots of academic studies that suggested that um, you know, companies that had more women in leadership actually performed better. So for the average investor who might be invested in you know, really any investment vehicle, whether it be an index vehicle or an active vehicle, by definition, they're getting the benefit of having their voice heard through the proxy process, through the voting process. But as index managers, that's a primary lever that we can pull. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that as it relates to you know, 401k accounts, um, you know, there's been a lot of back and forth in terms of the Department of Labor's position on how ESG uh, should be integrated into those kinds of platforms. And as uh, many on this call will know, you know, last year that was a really tricky uh, element to navigate because, in fact, you were getting guidance from the DOL that suggested that a focus on ESG might be at odds with a focus on the pecuniary or the financially material elements of an investment portfolio. We absolutely disagreed with that. We actually believe that ESG elements are foundational. They are pecuniary. They are financial. Um, and so it's, it's good to see the current administration uh, walking back some of that and, in fact, uh, pressing perhaps on uh, you know, acknowledging that ESG considerations can be material. And so it's not just um, you know, for something that is a, an impact outcome, but it can have an investment outcome and an impact outcome living side by side. Thank you very much, Lori. Okay, Joe, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I agree 100% with what Lori said. Uh, there's actually an example where institutions collaborated through engagement to get uh, Shell Oil to uh, incorporate into their executive compensation uh, climate change uh, goals and targets to where Shell now is committed to reduce their global emissions by, I believe, 50% by 2050. So collaboration really makes a difference. And to do it within a 401k, I would think that the investors, if they invest with the right institution, they can read and see what their proxy voting policies are and see if they're in line with the uh, individual's values. And if they are, they stay with that 401k provider. So I think with a lot of knowledge out there that people are learning, they're able to make better decisions and uh, make a real difference. Absolutely, Joe. And um, one of the areas that we touched upon in the beginning of the, the panel was the management companies themselves. You know, there's one thing about the investments that you're making, but what about the advice that you're giving on the management companies themselves? And, and with that, you know, just, you know, it came up a couple of times about climate change. After you give your overall, maybe you could touch specifically on how they're addressing climate change. Okay. Yeah, it's not actually how they want to address it. It's how their investors want the management companies to address it. The investors believe the manager should walk the walk to match the talk. That's a verbatim quote from one of the investors. And you'll see a lot of the due diligence now come through and ask, what is the manager's inclusion policy? What is the managed diversity policy, retention, training? They want to understand what's the social aspects of that particular manager, how they uh, play with their community, and what they ha how they look at the environment. So onto the climate change, a lot of managers now are also being asked, what do they do in terms of their own emissions? They want, people want to know, what is their carbon footprint, and are they going to go uh, neutral uh, sometime in the future? So managers are really push, being pushed along in terms of becoming better and better citizens, and as they become more and more aware of the benefits of it, I see managers uh, not pushing back as much. So you're seeing more managers now have corporate social responsibility programs more than ever. You'll see it on their websites, and you're going to see it within their uh, recruitment pamphlets. So that is where we see with the management company, and it's 100% investor-driven, yet I think managers are starting to see the benefits of incorporating those policies into their operating operations. Um, how managers are addressing carbon and emissions? Uh, in the United States, which is much different than Europe, uh, managers are, in the beginning, wanted to close their eyes. 
I mean, it's unfortunate that climate change became a political term. And if you're a Republican or a Southern state, maybe you don't believe in it or maybe you want to disavow it. But when institutions start looking at the risks and the transitional opportunities that take place when looking at climate change, they begin to embrace it. So what we're finding is that managers are going to start measuring carbon. We're seeing this now uh, at the management company level and considering doing it at the portfolio level. And then we believe that going forward with uh, some of the European regulations coming down the pike and having U.S. and managers having that European money, that they're going to start measuring the portfolio emissions to try to bring that down in line with the Paris Agreement. So we're starting to see some movement towards um, climate mitigation, but it's not quite as fast as the Europeans are. Thank you, Joe. And in, in our, some of our prep calls, you talked a little bit about some of the best practices and tips that you provide clients uh, relating to, you know, inclusion and training and retention. Can you maybe just overall give a, a quick summary of what you're seeing as some best practices in those areas? Well, a lot of the managers I work with are not smaller, they can have between 100 people to 10 people in the office, but they have very little turnover. And they always say, well, we want to have diversity, we want to have inclusion, but we have nobody leave the company. So the first thing I suggest to them is we'll have a policy that if you ever do need to hire somebody, make sure you include a diverse pool of candidates. You will find quality candidates out there in diversity. So make sure that you do that. Uh, the second step to do is to actually create mentor programs at the lower levels and bring interns in from uh, disadvantaged groups into the practice. And those are two items, of action points that they can do right now to be able to you know, embrace diversity, embrace inclusion, even though they're not having the turnover that they might uh, enable them to show that they embrace it. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Lori, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, look, I think that companies do have to walk the talk. And again, going back to the example I shared earlier related to our efforts on board diversity, one of the first questions that a lot of people asked was, well, what are State Street's uh, diversity metrics like? And we had to acknowledge that at that point in time, they weren't where we wanted them to be. But it created a lot more uh, energy around you know, putting in place targets, holding managers accountable to those targets, having compensation tied to the achievement of interim and long-term diversity metrics. So I think it is increasingly um, incumbent upon all of us to embrace these issues ourselves. And I would even go a step further in, in terms of a lot of consultants and a lot of the uh, larger institutional asset managers are including a lot of these types of issues in their RFP process. In some cases, they're even curious what you're doing with your own supply chain. So um, how are you looking at diversity across all the different providers that you use, whether it be your trading partners or your vendors and suppliers and other things. So these issues are only going to intensify, and I think the earlier that managers can start to think through how they'll respond really and whether that's putting in place plans for the future or whether that's uh, you know, putting teeth into the plans that they already have and holding managers accountable, those will all be things that I think will continue to get ratcheted up as uh, asset managers are being scrutinized on these topics. Yeah, absolutely, Laurie. I couldn't agree more. And these plans, um, you know, they're, they're plans for the future, and you mentioned putting teeth on them. Um, you know, many of the world's uh, most, some of the largest uh, carbon intensive companies have, you know, put out public responses about their, their long term viability in decarbonizing the world by announcing some new net zero goals. But there's a lot of questions really that remain about the credibility of those strategies. Maybe you could talk a little bit about ways that, you know, maybe it's it, State Street or some of the other ways that you see companies putting those teeth behind it, how they can take a plan and actually put some, some real focus around it um, so that, that it becomes, you know, achievable. And then what will be the checkpoints going forward as it relates to that plan? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things. And, and carbon's a great example where, as you note, there are increasing number 
of you know, net zero initiatives, you know, the, the task force for climate-related financial disclosure, things of that nature. And I think what, what we would say is that everybody's still figuring a lot of these things out, right? Um, these mm -hmm. are complex issues. The, in, in many cases, the da data is not available. You know, the transition risks are incredible. So if you think about um, you know, companies signing up for their own net zero targets, today they can do that through offsets can do that through offloading assets. And it, what's going to be really important is how the industry is engaging around the implications of some of those transitional elements and the risks that they create. Because if you just rely on carbon offsets, you're not really solving the problem. And if you divest those assets to you know, public enterprises or you know, other private equity or areas that aren't as, as uh, heavily regulated, then potentially you're creating uh, you know, other kind of downstream issues and, and burdens on society. So I think that this has a lot of different dimensions. And first and foremost, there has to be a kind of honest um, you know, assessment of your company's willingness to tackle these things in a real way, right? And that's why, why we leverage engagement and proxy voting and, and stewardship as uh, such a key element because that way you can get in, you can talk to the boards, you can talk to the management, you can understand not just what they're saying publicly, but what's driving that and how do they see that fit into their long-term corporate strategy. Because if there's a disconnectedness, then it raises all sorts of issues about how robust and you know, achievable it's going to be. And, and, and look, I, again, I think that the, the pressures are building also for whether it's regulatory frameworks. You know, again, we're seeing lots of things coming out of Europe that are requiring large asset managers to disclose their uh, portfolio metrics, and, and that's creating pressure, you know, on the companies that underlie those portfolios to respond. It's creating, you know, incentives and pressures for asset managers. Uh, there are some uh, budding initiatives that are going to target consult the consultant community. So, yeah, I think that getting, um, kind of getting your own head around what this might mean and how you're going to position your firm to respond to it is going to be critical for literally every leader on this call. That's right. And, you know, getting ahead of those, um, you know, the systems that you need, the controls that you need to put it together, because I think there's going to be, like you mentioned, a lot of disclosure of data where investors and other stakeholders can really compare um, the transition and the pathway that you're taking, not only um, yourself, but then possibly and more broadly, the, the other companies in, in your sector or focus. Okay, hey, Joe, I'd like to ask you a question relating to returns and superior returns. You know, of late, there's been um, some very strong um, returns coming from this, the ESG-focused type of investments. I uh, wanted you to comment on what that looks like going forward and what you believe to be if it's a superior return or not. Okay, well, I believe it depends. So ESG is meant to identify risks and long-term opportunities, and that's the investment process it follows. Uh, a lot of the ESG news that's coming in the papers today that you're reading about are all short-term investments or quarterly to quarterly returns where those particular ESG funds are heavily invested in technology, which is doing very well. Uh, one of the best ESG-rated funds is Microsoft, is ESG is Microsoft doing very well because of ESG, or is Microsoft doing well because it's a great sector? So I think that you need to look over the long term to see whether ESG investing makes a difference. I believe personally that uh, because of its long-term outlook, ESG will return superior returns, but from a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis, you're not going to really see that. And I think that kind of gets you into the greenwashing or the marketing where the marketers are telling you that this is where you should allocate your money because last quarter it was up 20%. Um, it doesn't, I don't think that's ESG. I think ESG is more of the year-over-year -year type of uh, view of the world. Thanks, Joe. Lori, do you have um, something to add to that? Yeah, I think a couple of points I would make. I totally agree that you can't just look at last year's performance and say, okay, ESG outperforms, because that was, to Joe's point, a lot about the sectors that were prioritized and 
some of the um, other foundational things, you know, energy, for example, last year didn't do so well, and yet, you know, year to date it's doing quite well. So you have to sort of look through that. What I would say, though, is that we've done a lot of research that suggests that a company's ESG footprint says something about the quality of its management team. And by that, what I mean is that companies that are more aware of the ESG risks that are inherent in their business enterprises and take the steps to manage or mitigate those risks actually do do better. And so in many cases, understanding how the ESG elements are interacting with the core business and how that might create future situations that might be, you know, disasters or fraudulent activities or other things. And, and we can all think of companies, you know, that have littered the landscape because they've had some major blow up. And I can tell you that our research suggests that in many of those cases, there were early warning signs that those companies were missing something. And so from our vantage point, there is this kind of long term you know, promise, if you will, of ESG, certainly to the degree that capital flows towards companies that are better, you know, global citizens, one would imagine that those companies would also outperform. But there also is something more fundamental in terms of how these um, elements get managed within a company context and what kinds of risks that enables management to mitigate and how they can you know, re- re- remain focused on the core business versus having to fight fires that we've also seen as a pretty good marker around um, you know, a future alpha or risk mitigant proposition. Yeah, and you make a good point about the air. there isn't a tremendous amount of time here. It is somewhat limited what we've seen as it relates to uh, data available. So um, in decades to come, you know, that could, could change. One other question, we're talking about the returns. We've also seen, and I think there's been a few studies on this, that it typically that those products will typically carry a higher fee. So, um, and, and maybe that's because of the recording, the types of companies, the, the diligence. But, um, Laurie, just to stay with you, are you seeing that these types of vehicles are typically charging a, a premium to the, the standard fee? It really depends. Um, you know, if I just think about, again, the kind of broader index book of business, to the degree that there are exclusionary screens or, um, you know, some positive tilting or other things, it's, it's pretty similar to a traditional market cap weighted benchmark. So there aren't really um, a lot of premium pricing, you know, available in, in a case where you're doing some very straightforward ESG types of things. What we are seeing, though, is in many cases, um, you know, managers are launching impact products or um, thematic products, and oftentimes those have a much higher fee because there's a promise of some intellectual capital there or or intellectual property that's being exploited and the promise, frankly, of alpha, uh, or maybe not the promise of alpha, but the expectation, the hope of alpha. alpha. So I think like any product set, uh, an investor really needs to understand, you know, what are they getting here? How does that shape, you know, uh, measure up vis-a-vis the benchmarks? And are they actually getting value for money? But look, the whole industry is, is confronted with trying to find ways to retain pricing power. And so it's not surprising that if you have an ESG thesis, you might be able to have a premium price attached to that, but you have to look beyond and say, is there a core value proposition here that warrants that higher fee? Absolutely. Thank you for that, Lori. Jody, I have some uh, comments relating to fees on these types of vehicles and investments. So I've only had, I, in terms of research and explaining how ESG ratings work in terms of advising managers and using them, I've come across a couple ETFs, which I'm not going to say what the names of them are, but they're effectively a fintech fund where they're charging 40 or 50 basis points a year, where they could have done the same fund with State Street for five basis points. So, I mean, but that information is disclosed, so investors beware. They should look to see what's underneath the portfolios of these ETFs that have the uh, ESG label. Good point, Joe. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Lori and Joe, for your time today. Appreciate all of your responses, and it sounds like ESG has uh, a definite path and growing for uh, the future. And by beware on some of the documents to make sure that we're getting the right type of uh, ESG.